to take it away, Ryan and Charles. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, can everybody hear me? Just give me a quick thumbs up. Awesome. All right, well, um, I first wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. I know there's lots of things you can do with your time and the fact that there are about 100 people who signed up to attend this uh, shows just the interest and commitment with this campaign that we've been working on for 10 years. And I'm really grateful for your investment and your curiosity in it if you're less familiar with it and you wanna learn more. Uh, again, my name is Charles Dremel. I've uh, been working on this campaign for now seven years, uh, took over for, from Scott. Uh, and it really has um, been a strong passion of mine and has taken, taken a strong part of my heart uh, throughout this time period. I've gotten to know a lot of these rivers, which you'll see throughout um, today's presentation. And um, just really excited to share what we have with you and the great work that Ryan and I have been doing. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, um, let's see if I can, sorry, I just having some, there we go. Okay. So I'd like to start with a story here. And that is that um, this is a, a little corner of Northwest Montana, a couple hundred miles as a crow flies from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And this is the story is just to present some context and provide some context for you all. Back in the 1940s, the Bureau of Reclamation was looking for dams all across the West, uh, looking for places to build dams all across the West. And one of the places they looked was on the west side of Glacier National Park on the North Fork of the Flathead River. Well, you can imagine Glacier National Park uh, employees and staff were not very excited about this proposition and they said go look elsewhere. The public didn't want it there either because it would have flooded part of Glacier National Park. So the next place the Bureau of Reclamation looked was up the middle fork of the Flathead River, which is just a little bit to the east and that's where this picture is. Um, this is some, of, especially in the 1940s and 1950s, this was some of the best remaining grizzly bear habitat in the Northern Rockies. Um, there's, you can see some white water in this picture that's called Spruce Park Rapids. And that's right where the Bureau of Reclamation was proposing to build a dam. Well, at the time, two eminent grizzly bear biologists, the Craighead brothers, were working on grizzly bear conservation in this region and they said, no, let's not do this here. One of the worst places, we've, we've got to figure out a way to prevent this dam from going. And so they started um, working with folks back in DC to say, we need to develop some kind of policy that prevents dam building and what's more protects free flowing rivers and the fisheries habitat, the wildlife habitat, the recreation opportunities and the scenery associated with these places because we already have a lot of um, amazing rivers that have been impacted by dam development. So they successfully bought the proposal to build a dam here in the middle fork of the Flathead and they crafted the language for what would become the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. This of course was at really the culmination of the dam building era for the United States which started in around 1900 and ended in the 1970s. Um, there are now about 75,000 large dams. That's a dam larger than 50 feet in height across the United States. That's like building one dam a day since Thomas Jefferson was born. We have a huge legacy of dam building across this country for good reasons. Water storage for irrigation, uh, flood control, transportation, hydropower. But folks who were working on the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act back in the 60s realized that we needed to figure out a way to complement that dam building era with, some, with a conservation policy. So they crafted the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. It passed ultimately in 1968, just four years after the Wilderness Act. And it was meant to serve as a complement to that dam building era. And I really wanna emphasize um, that term complement. At the time, this was not like a anti-dam building movement. It wasn't, or I shouldn't, I should say it wasn't at a, a, a dam deconstruction movement. It was just say, let's protect and preserve what we have left. Uh, initially, there were eight wild and scenic rivers designated in 1968. And now there are over 200. We have 226 designated rivers, which cover 
roughly 13,000 and change river miles that are protected in the United States for their free flowing status um, and the remarkable values associated with them. Uh, just like to, to draw some comparisons here, that's a quarter of 1% of the rivers in the United States that are protected under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. There are 600,000 river miles that are inundated by reservoirs right now, which accounts for about 17 to 19% of our rivers. So if you compare the impact of dams to the conservation value of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in terms of numbers, we still have a lot of work to do. And that's something that we're excited about here in, uh, at GYC. So quick question for you guys, feel free to th throw um, some names in the chat. I know folks are scattered all across this country. I'm curious to know what rivers are protected as wild and scenic in your state, if you are familiar with that. And as you're, as you're placing those names in the chat, I'll just keep moving forward with our presentation here. And before I hand it over to Ryan, um, note that you know, what we're working on here is a, a pretty large, um, ambitious idea for protecting wild and scenic rivers in Montana. And it takes an act of Congress to do this. Um, there are two paths to wild and scenic river designation. The second path is for the governor to petition to the Secretary of Interior if there is an in-state um, river conservation system. We don't have that in Montana. We don't have that in Wyoming or Idaho. So really our path to protecting more free flowing rivers is just through an act of Congress. If we can see what rivers people are bringing up. Oh, not while I'm sharing my screen. Let's chat a little bit about what it does though. Um, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act obviously has a really interesting history and story behind it. Uh, and it's a, it's a powerful piece of legislation. It really is the gold standard in river protection in the United States because it protects three things, if you wanna really boil it down. First, it protects water quality. And that can mean all kinds of things. It could be temperature, pollutants, the water quality in the river has to either stay where it's at or get better over time on designated rivers. Um, the second is it protects the free flowing character of that river. And that harkens back to what Charles was talking about in regard to complementing the great dam building era um, of this country. So you can't build a dam or impede the free flow on a wild and scenic river. And then the third thing, which to me, I find really the most interesting is it protects something called outstanding values. And those could be nearly anything. They're whatever makes that river special and unique. And so in that way, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act really protects individual unique special places as they are. A couple examples of that. Um, it could be something like fisheries. Here's a photo of a beautiful native cutthroat trout. Um, if a river is particularly valuable for native fish species, that's a, a reason for an outstanding value that qualifies it for wild and scenic. Um, could be wildlife habitat. And it can also be um, human characteristics on the river if it has cultural values, historic values um, for indigenous peoples. Cultural values are also uh, qualified. Could be geology, um, really interesting geology on that river. And of course, it can be recreation. Uh, if the river is particularly well known and valuable um, for recreators of different types, anglers, paddlers, whomever. And it protects those things, free flow, um, water quality and values, not just on the river itself, but along a corridor on either side of that river that's supposed to average a, a quarter mile from the river's edge on either direction. Because what uh, happens uphill flows downhill, right? Um, and you need to protect the habitat next to the river in order to make sure that the ecosystem along it is healthy. I think it's also important to note a few things that the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act does not do. Um, we get asked a lot of those questions in our work day to day. Um, so the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act does not affect water rights. It doesn't threaten water rights. 
It doesn't threaten private property rights. Um, it does not impede on recreation or access. And it also doesn't change fishing and hunting regulations on that river. So it really is meant to keep the river as it remains today for future generations. That's really the beauty of it. All right, I'm just gonna share a few uh, reasons why we typically engage in wild and scenic river campaigns. Again, some more context here. The first is protecting biodiversity. As a conservation organization, this is first and foremost in our mission. In the American West, riparian areas and their river corridors occupy about 1% of the landscape. And yet 75 to 80% of all terrestrial life, depending on where you are in the ecosystem, rely on those riparian areas for part of their life cycle. Furthermore, 50% of those terrestrial wildlife depend are obligates to riparian zones. Riparian zones are keys to biodiversity, one of the most important places that we can work on in conservation. Uh, these rivers and their riparian areas are also um, headwaters for climate refugia. We have, we're, we're fortunate in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to have some of the best climate re refugia. This is clean, cold water that is very likely to persist 40 to 80 years out into the future. It supports native fish, it supports other um, wildlife. These are the places that are worth protecting. Water, of course, all water is source water. For, um, and there are many communities here in Montana that rely on surface water for um, municipal consumption. And then of course we have a thriving agricultural industry that relies on clean water for irrigation. Ryan mentioned the cultural outstanding remarkable values that can be associated with the river. I think it's important to note here that in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, we work on ancestral homelands of many native tribes. Uh, in the Gallatin Valley, it's the Nitsitapi Blackfeet and Salish and the Psalagay Crow. But all throughout this ecosystem, there are many different tribes that have historical so associations with our rivers. And uh, in working with tribes in this campaign, we've heard their reasons for protecting these resources. Uh, we have a booming tourism and outdoor recreation industry in Montana. And that has in fact been one of the great things to unite folks, businesses, people all around the region behind this legislation that we're working on. And then, um, you know, what's pretty typical and you hear this a lot, perhaps if you've been familiar with the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, is there are threats to our rivers that are immediate. And one of the first Wild and Scenic Rivers campaigns that the Greater Yellowstone Coalition worked on in the mid 80s was protecting the Clark's Fork of the Yellowstone. And that, if you're not familiar with that stream, it flows out of the Beartooth Mountains in Montana down into Wyoming through an incredible uh, canyon system, which is world renowned for its whitewater, for expert uh, whitewater paddlers. And then it flows out of a canyon and ultimately into the main Yellowstone River. There was a dam proposed here for water storage. Greater Yellowstone Coalition worked with our partners um, to protect that uh, river. And that became Wyoming's first designated wild and scenic river in 1990. Uh, a little bit more recently in 2009, GYC worked with our partners to protect the snake headwaters, which uh, all told was uh, 13 different river segments over 415 river miles. Um, the main included the main stem of the snake and many others. Um, and that was for many different purposes, outdoor recreation, uh, climate refugia, native fish conservation. And most recently, we've had success in fighting a dam that was proposed on East Rosebud Creek, which also flows out of the Beartooth Range, but on the north side, on the Montana side. Um, and that culminated with the passage of Wild and Scenic River legislation recently in 2018. When GYC successfully passed the Snake Headwaters uh, Wild and Scenic Bill in 2009, that was coupled with a big omnibus land package in Congress that protect, protected other wild and scenic rivers in Western Idaho and the Oahe Canyon system and then down in Utah. Um, and we realized at the time that, you know what, if, if we can work on wild and scenic river conservation in these politically more conservative states, we should certainly be able to do something of this nature in Montana. 
We knew intuitively that Montanans care about rivers. And of course, economically, people come from all over the world to recreate here, particularly to fly fish our rivers. So we, we, we realized there was an opportunity um, to, to elevate river conservation and start diversifying uh, the stakeholders who might be interested in this and working with more partners. So we formed a coalition called Montans for Healthy Rivers, which is made up of private landowners, watershed groups, conservation groups, sportsmen, brick and mortar businesses and big businesses um, to come together to support new wild and scenic river legislation. And we, we kind of have, have um, stood behind this idea that collectively river conservation is important for our economy, it's important for our environment and it's important for our way of life. And that message is really unified um, Montanans from every corner of the state. Over a 10 year period, we have conducted outreach from Red Lodge to Whitefish. And initially it involved asking people in communities, what rivers are important to you in your own watershed? And here's a tool called the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which most folks were not familiar with because it hadn't been used in Montana since 1976. We provided a lot of literacy about what the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act does and doesn't do to more detail than we're, we're doing this afternoon for you all. And then we just asked for feedback. We, we asked for a lot of input. And through that process, we developed draft legislation, which ultimately became known as the Montana Headwaters Security Act. And it focused on protecting rivers in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, as well as up in the Crown and the Continent ecosystem. We shop that around again with the same communities and said, are these the right rivers? We also every year went back to Washington DC to work with our uh, US delegation to hear their support, to hear their input on this. Um, and at the same time, while we were doing this, the East Rosebud Wild and Scenic Rivers bill got traction and support from our whole delegation It became bipartisan. There was a lot of excitement. And ultimately what we heard from our delegation as we were passing the East Rosebud bill is we think that the best next path for wild and scenic in Montana is a more geographically focused bill. And the feedback we received was that the most support exists within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so from there, we crafted um, this next legislation, um, which became the Montana Headwaters uh, Legacy Act. And Ryan's gonna provide a little bit of detail about what these rivers are, where they are, and why they're important. Who doesn't love a good map? These are, these dark uh, blue lines represent the river segments that we have our eye on now, the ones that we're working to protect as wild and scenic. Just to orient folks, um, of course, Yellowstone National Park is there in purple. All of the green land is uh, public national forest land. And then the dark green areas actually represent wilderness. Um, East Rosebud Creek is that red line on the right side of the large map. So the Montana Headwaters Legacy Act, which Charles and I spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about every day, uh, it totals about 336 river miles combined through all these segments. Um, that's 17 different rivers and streams throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, as well as the Smith River and its main tributary Tenderfoot Creek, which is in that little um, black box map that's to the north. Um, I'm gonna chat a little bit about some of these segments just to give you all an idea of the special places that we're working on. And while I do, I'd love to hear in the chat which of Greater Yellowstone's rivers are most familiar to you all? Which do you have a personal connection with or um, want to visit one day? We'd love to know the names that really stand out to you. So first up, this is a gorgeous shot of the upper Madison River. Um, it was on the left side of that map. And the Madison is actually a river that we are trying to protect two separate segments as wild and scenic. So when you, you protect a river as wild and scenic, you're actually protecting a specific mileage of that river. Um, this is a photo from the upper segment and the Madison is really famous the region over for um, recreation opportunities in particular um, for its abundant fishery there. You can see a couple of anglers here in this photo. This is a shot of the West Boulder River um, and this is not one that I've actually visited personally but of all the rivers in the Montana Headwaters Legacy Act it's the one that I'm most excited to see 
Uh, this season, it stretches really deep into the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness above Yellowstone National Park. And I've just been enchanted by this trail on the map that follows this endless river valley. Looks like outstanding fly fishing and hiking and camping. Really gorgeous area. Um, next, we have the Gallatin River. Uh, a lot of you folks will probably be familiar with this one from the movie, A River Runs Through It. Um, it was not supposed to take place on the Gallatin River, but a lot of filming actually happened here on the Gallatin. And that's the river that runs right past Bozeman where we live and work. Um, again, really popular for whitewater rafting and fishing and um, just about anything else you can think of runs right past Big Sky. Next, of course, we have the Yellowstone River through Paradise Valley. Um, the Yellowstone, I mean, what can I say? It's iconic. Um, people love to float it and fish on it, um, paddle it. It's really important for uh, local wildlife species migrating in and out of the park. Um, the Smith River, this was the one that's outside of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as we usually define it. Um, of course, all these landscapes are connected and the Smith River is really popular amongst Montanans. You actually have to get a permit to raft this um, really iconic stretch of river. There are huge towering cliffs. There's phenomenal fly fishing. Um, there's a lot of cultural significance to the Smith. There's a lot of cultural sites along the Smith and it's uh, tributary Tenderfoot Creek, really striking landscapes. And then the last one, here's a shot of Charles. Um, this has to be my favorite river in the Montana Headwaters Legacy Act. This is Taylor Creek. Um, and Taylor Creek, Charles and I, and one of our colleagues, Emmy, had the uh, opportunity to paddle this stretch of river at peak runoff last spring. It was a phenomenal experience. Um, we paddled it from near its headwaters uh, down very close to where it joins the uh, Gallatin River and just got to have a really unique perspective on um, the variety of landscapes that it passes through. It begins up in the mountains and it flows through a really serene um, high alpine meadow. And then finally it tumbles down through endless class two whitewater and, and sagebrush hills. So it's a very varied and gorgeous river here on the Taylor Creek. So you can imagine with rivers like that in our backyard here in Montana, Montanans get very excited about river conservation. Uh, we have known intuitively that Montanans care about their rivers, but we felt as part of our campaign that it'd be really important to have some um, statistical significance. And so we, we've done a number of polls over the years. Um, not we've, we've paid professional pollsters to do this work um, and one of the first things that we learned is that 86% of Montanans think that protecting our rivers is good for our economy and way of life. We also learned that two thirds of Montanans recreate on a river annually, shows you that, that connection that also doesn't include the irrigation connection, the agricultural connection, which would bump it up even more. And then last year, uh, we had some questions on a University of Montana statewide poll um, that showed to our excitement, 79% of Montanans want to see the Montana Headwaters Legacy Act passed in Congress. That's eight out of 10 Montanans, super, super powerful. And it's really hard, you know, when, when you're talking about natural resource conservation policy and um, bills that are in Congress, it's, it's really hard to find that kind of support um, for legislation. And we have it right here in Montana. Um, and and there's, there's lots of reasons why. I mean, obviously some of the photographs that Ryan showed are stunning, um, but there's, there's, I wanna just highlight two key pieces. And one is our outdoor recreation is huge right now in Montana and it continues to grow. It's a $7.1 billion industry and our agricultural economy is gigantic as well. $5.2 billion industry combined it's important that we, and people know, I should say, that healthy rivers, clean water support both of these industries. So we are excited to move forward in, in protecting these landscapes. We have incredible momentum right now with this legislation. In a 10 plus year period of doing outreach, we've gotten endorsements from over a thousand Montanan businesses 
That also includes trade groups that represent fishing and backcountry outfitting. We have all kinds of small and large outdoor recreation companies and, and hospitality companies. Uh, we also have diversity here. There are, are developers who are on board with this legislation. One of the largest, I should say the largest platinum palladium mining company in North America supports this and the river, the Stillwater River flows right through their property um, in the Stillwater Valley. We have tribes that support this. We have county commissions that have endorsed it and mayors at a very local government level. And across the state, we've cultivated the support from 3,000 Montanans through social media. We've got over 6,000 followers on our Montanans for Healthy Rivers Facebook page. We've got a newsletter of over 3,000. And this all led to Senator Tester um, last year saying, yeah, let's do this. I want to introduce this legislation and I want to make this happen. Um, and so we had a real exciting moment. You can see this happen during COVID. Um, of course, still happen, still going on, but uh, we, we were being incredibly careful out here for a, a public event in November. Um, you could see fresh snow. This is right in front of the Gallatin River. Um, and Senator Tester uh, formally introduced the Montana Headwaters Legacy Act. And that was, of course, in the last congressional ses session, which was 116th Congress. So we are now in a phase where we're looking at how do we pass this legislation? The first step is to get this bill reintroduced in the 117th Congress, which we have a commitment from Senator Tester to do. But there's some things that are really important here. Um, one is that, you know, we're incredibly grateful to have a sponsor. And yet this River Conservation Montana is a nonpartisan issue. We've proven that through the polling, we've proven that through the endorsements that we have from landowners, from business owners. People don't, you know, it doesn't matter who you voted for or what party you affiliate yourself with. We have folks from all walks of life that support this Montana Headwaters Legacy Act and we're really proud of that. And so our next step is to continue to demonstrate that support from the grassroots level to the grass tops level to the other two members of our Montana US delegation, which are Senator Danes and Representative Rosendale, so that they get on board with this and, and um, co-sponsor the legislation in the Senate and introduce companion legislation on the House side. So as we wrap up um, our presentation, there are two things. If, you're, if you feel moved about this work and connected to these rivers, there's two things that you guys can do to help us here. We've created a uh, Take Action website, which is at the top here. There's already a, a pre-written letter to Senator Danes and Representative Rosendale asking them to support this legislation. There's also a space for you to personalize it, and we really encourage you to personalize it, especially if you have a connection to the, these rivers or this landscape. I um, mean, then second, uh, Scott started off saying, we've been working on this campaign for 10, 11 years now. And it's, you know, our goal is to pass this legislation by the end of this legislative session, but there's all kinds of variables that come up that are totally out of our control that are happening in Washington, DC. And it takes financial resources for us to continue um, with these efforts. Uh, we've had incredible support over the years and we need to continue um, that financial support. So if you have it, uh, if you have the means, we really appreciate anything that you can give from five that $5 to $5,000 um, and anything in between. Um, so I think we're going to open it up for a Q and A and um, yeah, feel free to either put something in the chat um, or turn your microphone off of mute and speak up. Ryan and I can't see the chat right now. So may, I might ask um, uh, maybe Christy to moderate any of the questions that come from the chat. And while this slide is up, there's also email um, addresses for both Charles and myself. If folks want to have further conversations, they're welcome to reach out to us directly.
We're not seeing any questions at the moment, but um, Patrick wrote in to say that he's already asked one of his representatives our senators to support it out of Maryland. So thank you for that. Um, Patricia Simmons does have a question. Um, what federal agency would be involved with wild and scenic rivers so we can ask the Biden administration to support this? There are a couple of different agencies that will be involved in this. So as you can see from, or you maybe remember from the map that Ryan shared, um, most of these rivers are flowing through the Custer Gallatin National Forest. So that's the Forest Service that would be involved in managing these wild and scenic rivers or future wild and scenic rivers. The, the Madison River has uh, some segments that flow through BLM and that's uh, through the Bear Trap Canyon and below. And there's been a ton of interest from folks coming from Madison County and Gallatin County to expand the uh, Madison uh, boundary and the Madison corridor further downstream uh, onto more BLM and state lands that are in the center of the Madison Valley. So there could be more administration by the Bureau of Land Management. So essentially two land agencies would ultimately be in charge of managing these wild and scenic rivers. Good question. Another question here for you two. Um, what, what timeline is typical, this is from Ryan Sargent, what timeline is typical for designating a river as wild and scenic? Yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. What I've heard is that most wild and scenic river campaigns average about seven years. We're past that. Um, but we also had the f good fortune of passing the East Rosebud Wild and Scenic Rivers Act while we were working on this campaign. So we had a a, a very valuable and beautiful distraction. Um, but, you know, this is a big, it's an ambitious effort. You know, we're looking similar to the Snake Headwaters where we're looking on a watershed scale of wild and scenic river designations. We're covering multiple watersheds here. You know, there's the um, components of the Missouri Headwaters, components of the Yellowstone Headwaters. And there's, unlike the Snake, where you had really one big community of Jackson that's focused on those designations. We have communities sp spread from Ennis to Big Sky to Bozeman to Livingston and Gardner, all the way over to Red Lodge. Um, and then the, in, in Montana, everybody cares about the Smith, whether you're in Whitefish, Helena, Missoula, or Billings. Um, so we're spread out more, which maybe has um, extended the time frame. Um, for building the support needed for Senator Tester to take the step to introduce this legislation. Uh, we are hopeful with this congressional session um, that we can pass this legislation by the end of next year. A couple more here. Um, I'm gonna do a short one and then I'm gonna circle back to a little more involved one. Um, but Patrick asked if this bill has a number and has it been introduced yet? Um, Patrick, the bill was introduced in the last Congress and Charles and Ryan can share that bill number. Um, it has not been reintroduced in this current Congress. Anything you two would add there? Yeah, no bill number yet for this Congress. Mm -hmm. Another, this is a complicated one, uh, but a good one. This is from Ken and Colette who are in my home state of Idaho. Um, they say here in Idaho, our legislature passes bills to kill 90% of the wolf population. How do you in Montana deal with 79% of your citizens supporting river protection yet the elected officials don't seem to share a sense of caring for nature in general, much less waterways? You wanna start? <laughs> I, did, I did hear about that wolf legislation this morning. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it today. I think we are challenged to demonstrate the will of Montanans in a way that cannot be ignored, um, you know, in a, in a diverse way that really shows um, how many different voices are behind this. Charles mentioned just a little bit of what's given us so much momentum, you know, 3,000 individual endorsements, 1,000 businesses and organizations, that's huge. And then the challenge becomes, how do, we, how do we demonstrate that support so that the elected officials um, can't ignore it? 
Um, how do we present an accurate dialogue, a, a story of what we're doing here? Um, you know, this isn't about shutting down agriculture or industry. This is about supporting industry. I don't know how, I just want to mute it. That's where Turn I'm it off. There we go. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's about supporting, um, as Charles said, our way of life, our wildlife and our economy. Um, so keeping this as a, a nonpartisan issue, I think gives us a real um, strength. I don't know if that really gets at the question exactly. It's it's a tough one. I'll um, you know Ken and Colette. I, as as you all know, we probably all have some feel for. There's um there's a range of issues that we work on here in in this region, and probably none of them are as conflictual and challenging as uh, wildlife management and conservation. And and the wolf, of course, is epitomizes that. And we've seen similar uh, bad legislation here in Montana this session. And um, we, of course, are working every day that the sessions are in session in Helena uh, and other places to try and um, thwart those bills and build opposition to them and, um, and get them tabled. Um, I think with this last election and the political shift that we've seen, um, in the states that we work, that has become tougher. There's no doubt. Um, but again, I to, to Ryan's point, whether it's protecting rivers or trying to get uh, elected officials to be more reasonable on um, wildlife management uh, and wolf management in, in particular, we have to be able to demonstrate diverse support for that. And it can't just be the conservation group staff members showing up to hearings or weighing in, but we need all sorts of different voices uh, weighing in. And that's, that's really the only way we can get it done. And the other, the last thing I'll say is um, vote, please vote and get involved uh, in different ways in your community to help shape the makeup of things like our state legislatures and Congress. Good question. Yeah. Uh, but just one comment that um, Patricia Simmons made that I'll pass along. Um, she said, we can contact USDA, the USDA agriculture head Vilsack for support um, of this uh, bill. And I, I thanked Patricia for that. Thank you. Uh, another question from Patrick, do you have written confirmation of the business support? Yes, that, that's been really key. And that's something uh, all of our delegation has asked for. Um, so over the years, we've collected, you know, letters from Chambers of Commerce, letters from Sabanya Stillwater Mining Company, uh, lots of business owners. Uh, yeah, we, we, we continue to do this outreach every week. Ryan just uh, received uh, support from another watershed based group on the Boulder River, um, which is, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it's about halfway between uh, Livingston and Red Lodge. And that's just, that's really important to have that um, written support and to share that directly with the delegation every time we meet with them. Mm -hmm. Other questions or um, topics folks want to discuss related to, to this effort or others that GYC is involved in? Well, folks are uh, thinking about more questions. I just want to uh, highlight too that there are two more upcoming webinars happening, one May 18th and then a, uh, a second one May 25th. Uh, they're really interesting topics that our staff are working on here. And I highly encourage you uh, to take a look at these and, and sign up for them. You, know, you will learn a lot. Okay. Hey, Ryan and Charles, if you guys wanna um, uh, maybe stop the screen share, there we go. Um, 
another question from uh, Patrick here, who's stopping this and who are the power centers in your state? Take a stab at that. Um, I love getting this question in presentations of people ask like, okay, you've told me all the reasons why this is a great idea. Who disagrees with you? And we see it from a couple of sources. I think um, oftentimes folks are misinformed about what the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act does and doesn't do. Um, you know, maybe they're worried that it will remove their private property rights or threaten their water rights, something like that. Uh, and then we also see opposition for ideological reasons, folks who believe that any level of federal um, legislation, federal designation is kind of a slippery slope towards losing local control. Um, we really like to emphasize that the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act just allows um, federal agencies to consider the river's health when making decisions that they, decisions that they had to make anyway. Now they get to consider the river's free flow and, and water quality and those values when they make these decisions. In terms of who it is, um, I think it varies, but it's, it kind of comes from those sources. Charles, anything you would add to that? Yeah, right now we don't have any organized opposition um, it, the folks who have spoken up against this, which are very, very, very small percentage, um, mm -hmm. are just kind of in different pockets across the state, but there's no organization to them. And another thing that we tell folks is that 85% of these rivers that are in this legislation are flowing on public lands. So they're already managed as um, rivers by the public land agencies. And most of those are managed as eligible wild and scenic rivers, which means they've gone through an internal administrative review. Um, so we're, we're actually talking about trying to maintain um, the status quo to a large uh, extent and provide an insurance policy for keeping things as they are. I will just add on one quick thing to that. You know, our, our organizing right now and outreach is pretty directly focused on uh, people and entities who are important to, important to our Senator Steve Daines and um, new representative Matt Rosendale. Um, as was pointed out early, we need, earlier, we need a, an introduction of this legislation in the House. And so we really need to have representative Rosendale on board uh, and in his seat on the House, House Natural Resources Committee. Um, and then it would be uh, very helpful to have Senator Steve Dane supporting this as well. And so I know that a lot of the asks that Charles and Ryan are making of our supporters right now and um, the letter that they referenced that's on our website, um, those are directed at Senator Daines and, and Congressman um, Rosendale. And so if you have the chance um, to weigh in with them directly, we would really appreciate it. The more people they're hearing from as they kind of keep uh, their finger on the pulse of this work, the better. Um, and especially, uh, you know, from a diversity of people to Thanks, Scott. And as of yesterday in the census results, we'll, we'll have another uh, House representative in Montana to work with here in the mm -hmm. not too distant future. Fingers crossed. One thing that I'll say just in, for those of you who follow along closely with Congress, and this kind of gets to Patrick's question here too, is that uh, most of the most of the big natural resource and, and conservation legislation that's been passed in the last ten or twenty years has been in the form of a, a big omnibus package, and when that gets rolled together, there's a pretty careful calculus there about having a a, a pretty good balance of legislation supported and introduced by Democratic members and by Republican members. It's sort of the secret sauce for how they get the, these things to pass. And so what, and because most of our representation in this region is from the Republican side of the aisle, we tend to be one of those places where 
nationally, people will look to say, hey, is there a conserva piece of conservation legislation that we can roll in that has Republican support? Um, with Senator Tester here in Montana being an exception to that. But that's kind of the math that we're looking at um, throughout this Congress is to look around the rest of the country and see what are the other places where a similar legislation is coming together, who's introducing it, and how can ours be potentially packaged with and, and rolled into um, a larger package. Um, so that's one of the other considerations we have, and especially with Congress split so evenly right now and uh, such a, a tiny majority in place, that becomes even more important. So that's another thing to think about, and especially as we think beyond our congressional reps here in the greater Yellowstone uh, region and places like Maryland and others, as, as, as you see conservation legislation in those other places, we, we certainly are watching that closely and trying to um, make sure that we are pushing our legislation forward in a way that can get packaged and passed along with the others across the country. We're about out of time here. Um, and Charles mentioned a couple of the other uh, webinars we have coming up on May 18th. Um, conserving open landscapes, the public and private land relationship, and then more valuable than gold, uh, which is a kind of an overview of the mining threats here in the region on the 25th. Um, so please tune in to those. You can find more information about those on your website, uh, on our website. Um, and uh, thanks again for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate your interest and your support. And as Charles mentioned, we've made it pretty easy, we hope, uh, for you to get engaged and involved and support us, whether it's writing a letter through the portal on our website um, to our elected officials or hopping on to uh, the website to make an online donation. And of course, you can get Melissa Ritchie, our development director, uh, or myself, um, anytime you need us if you want to learn more um, or learn how you can make a contribution to our work. But thank you all again for joining us um, and uh, hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks, everybody.